God for that prelude. That was fantastic. We need to get us ready for the day. I'm excited to be here with you in God's house today. Welcome to St. Paul. I'm Pastor Rago. I am uh, thankful that we have Pastor Emeritus, Reverend Donald O. Newdorf, preaching for us today as we celebrate this homecoming service and all that God has done to richly bless St. Paul Lutheran Church and School, especially our school for the past 60 years. So let's stand and give thanks to God as we sing our opening hymn this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. You who fear the Lord, praise him. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship you, Lord. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. Austerity shall serve him. It shall be told the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come to proclaim his righteousness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have entrusted to your people the task of teaching all nations. Enlighten those who teach, those who learn, with the wisdom of your Holy Spirit. The joyous truth of the gospel may be known in every generation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
as we hear from God's Word. Our first reading for this morning comes from Psalm 71. O Lord, you are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. For the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will remind them of your righteousness, your salon. O God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age, great years, O God, you are not saving me until I proclaim your might to another generation. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also, which you have redeemed. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading comes from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 3. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. A man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. I invite the elementary students in our schools to come forward to sing for us this morning. Thank you. 
please stand as we hear the words of Jesus this morning from Matthew chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. He told them many things in parables, saying, a Sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We who have heard and believed confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of on one substance with the Father, fighting with all things that are made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And was crucified also for us in the conscious side. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge the open living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is sought by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. It's time for kids' words. So, any kids who are preschool through second grade. If you want to hear a message that's prepared just for you this morning, you can follow Miss Lexi and the cross. And I'll take you up to the fine arts room for that message. And we'll bring you back after the sermon is done. And the rest of us continue with our next hymn, Let Children Hear the Mighty Deeds.
you get to experience what I'm feeling right now. This feels good. It's so good to be home, to be back with you. I'm nervous, so that might be hard to believe, but uh, it's like riding a bicycle, right? It's our text from Paul's second letter to Timothy. He says, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. How from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. St. Paul is so blessed. I, I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you have a, enough of a base of comparison to appreciate what you have and what God has done and, and is doing here. I get around, I have gotten to a lot of churches. I, uh, I've labored in several different churches uh, from my vicarage in Ohio and First Parish in Wisconsin and the Second Church up north by Saginaw and then down here, but I've been circuit visitor, I've been part of four different circuits and that means about nine or ten congregations per circuit. And I was familiar with all of those congregations and with their pastors and with their leaders and what was going on there. And I watched what took place. We were in a congregation in Saginaw before seminary. And I was at, at age 20 or 21, I can't remember which, I was the vice chairman of the congregation, which shows you what desperate straits they were in. And... And they had a school there. And I watched what took place there. And as in the years that I was vice president of the district, I, I stepped into different congregations and different ministries and watched what was happening and talked with people. And, and then sometimes I was able to be on an accreditation team. Some of, some of our faculty have been able to participate in that. And you get a really close up view of somebody else's ministry both church and school. And let me tell you what, you don't know what a good thing you have. I've seen some wonderful churches, wonderful schools. I've also seen situations that were less, less joyful. You know that there are a lot of churches without a school, and, and they labor uh, heartily to, to make up that difference, to have, to have wonderful Christian education for their children. But the, the best that I saw was my father-in-law's congregation, a little church out in the country. They didn't have a school, but they had a Wednesday night school. And they worked to really make that complete. Everybody from little up to old age, there was education for everybody. It was the education evening. And they had dinner and they had classes. But you know what? Over time, the world pulls every time slot in the week away. Pretty soon it's harder and harder to get people to, to come and learn and grow in God's word together. And I've, and I've taught a lot of students who, who did not have the blessing of, of a Christian school. And you're trying to teach them in confirmation and they're faithful Christians and their parents are faithful believers and they came to church every Sunday and they were in Sunday school. But the, the little bit of time that you could get just some Bible stories in Sunday school meant that in confirmation instruction, you'd have to teach the whole Christian faith in an hour a week. At the worst possible time, a Saturday morning or a, or a Wednesday evening or after school when they had no more brain left. And what a difference it is. 
to teach students who have been grounded in God's word, whether at home or in school, but students who really have a foundation in the word of God and understand these concepts that we're sharing them. You have got something wonderful. I've been in churches where, where the spirit was church versus school. And where, where there was competition for the budget or competition for staff. You can't hire more people for this because we need more people for that. Or competition for space. That kitchen belongs to the ladies' aid and you cannot use it. Right? I've been to congregations where it was maybe not church versus school. There's pastor versus teachers. That, that's hard to believe. But there are sometimes, because of our sinful flesh, people who, who think that they need to protect their turf and keep others from influencing it, whether from the school end or from the church end. And let me tell you what, that ends really badly. I've been in congregations where they closed their school. It's like, what was it, Hemingway, I think, one of his characters talks about how he went bankrupt. At first, he says two ways, at first slowly, and then very suddenly. And that's how ministries also are lost. When we don't love them and care for them and nurture them and pay attention to them and use them and, re and celebrate them. When we don't realize what we have, do you know what you've got here? My goodness. The, uh, I'll, do, I'll let you in on a little inside baseball, which Steve Kemp will tell you, I know nothing about real baseball, but this kind of, the inside, how, how things work with church workers, there's actually a debate in corners of our synod over the relationship between pastors and teachers from the scriptures. And people argue over Ephesians chapter 4, verse, oh, where am I? Verse 11, Paul is talking about the gifts that God gave. That's kind of ironic. We're talking, looking a gift horse in the mouth here when people question this. He talks about the gifts that God gave when he ascended on high. Uh, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And the, what are the gifts? He says, uh, he ascended to heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave, he gave us, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. And the, so the debate is, I don't know where you fall on this, Ted, but the debate is, should there be a comma between shepherds, pastors, and teachers? That they're two separate things. Well, I hate to tell you this, teachers, if you look at the Greek, it, it doesn't separate them. Actually, it separates all these other things and then says, Shepherds and teachers is like it's one thing. And so some people, though, however, take that to mean that really the only office in the church is pastor. And we sort of we sort of have this side thing. The teachers, I don't think that's fair either. But people, people argue over this. Here's an interesting thing. The letter that that's written in is the letter to what congregation? The church in Ephesus. Do you know who the pastor was in Ephesus? That was Timothy. And we happen to have two letters to Timothy where Paul goes on at greater length about what, he, what it means for Timothy to serve as a pastor. And I've, I have read these letters over and over again in the course of my ministry because there's a lot of instruction and a lot of encouragement there. How do you... How do you figure out this being a pastor? 
And so Paul's writing to his young friend who's, who's leading a congregation in Ephesus with congregations around it, and it's a big, complicated ministry. And what does he focus on in the books of First and Second Timothy? I would suggest to you that First and Second Timothy say that teaching, more so than preaching, that or the that they cannot necessarily be separated, but that teaching is the heart of the ministry of the gospel. However you get it done, and it may not be able to be with a Christian school, but teaching, teaching is the heart of the ministry of the gospel, and learning, participating in that teaching, is essential for you as a member of the body of Christ. Let's, if you have your Bible with you, flip back to the beginning of 1 Timothy. We'll just, we're going to make a quick, I, I told a couple people, my text is going to be all of 1 and 2 Timothy. Which <laughs> is no problem because we've got, we got all morning here, right? But let's do a quick, Overview here. Chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. He, he's going to share stuff that's important for his child, his son that he's raised in the faith and brought into the ministry. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so may charge certain persons not to teach any different teaching. It says doctrine. You're probably looking at ESV there. It's, I think NIV says doctrine. I think KJV says doctrine. I think, but actually, it's the same word that he just used a minute before. They just translated it differently because when we talk about teaching in the Bible, I don't know, everyone wants to use the word doctrine, but it's only the word didaskos. It's still the same word. Tell people don't teach wrong teaching. The first thing... That Paul says about, here's how you want to be a pastor in Ephesus, is don't let teachers teach wrong teaching. Because teaching is so important. He says, the aim of our charge is love. This is, this is the point. It issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, sincere faith. Certain people desiring to be teachers of the law. So they have a problem here in Ephesus with for teachers. I'm trying to go look here. Well, look at that. That's the farthest I've ever been on. Karen, what are you doing? You were probably going out of your mind. This is something that... Oh my God, please move this thing. You know what? Here's a, another little piece of inside baseball. Jessica, did this happen to your dad? That the stole always migrates? Yeah, Jessica. The stole always migrates. It just goes like that. Okay. That was a distraction. Where was I? Paul? Paul, teaching. Thanks. They have a problem in Ephesus with teachers who are doing wrong teaching. And Paul goes on and on about uh, things that are contrary to sound teaching, verse 10. Um, he says, chapter 2, Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. This is the testimony given at the right time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. He's a preacher, an apostle, and a, and a teacher. He doesn't separate those out as if he's only one of them. And so he goes on about prayer. Um, and he says, therefore, an overseer, that is a pastor, one that, somebody who's going to be in charge of a congregation, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. All the other things he describes about what it means to be a pastor are character traits. Not being a drunk. I, I'm, 
Sorry, I'm not pointing at you, friend. <laughs> but, you know, husband of one wife, being an honorable person. The one skill that he says that you have to be able to do, he's got to be able to teach. Churches today, you want somebody who has some business acumen, right? You should be able to read spreadsheets. You should be able to lead a meeting and so on. But the, but the Bible says he's got to be a teacher. First of all, he's got to be a teacher because the ministry is about teaching. He goes on. Uh, chapter 4. For this, to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people. So he says to Timothy, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Practice these things. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. I didn't count how many times he says this, but it's teaching, teaching, teaching all through 1 Timothy against those who are teaching falsely, with those encouraging those who are teaching well, keeping a hold of the teaching, the truth, and reinforcing it. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. There is no one who is in preaching who is not in teaching. And so he says in chapter 6, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different teaching, it's not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So and then in 2 Timothy, he says, therefore, this is at verse 41, I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. <laughs> Paul says that teaching is the most critical thing. There's another verse I'm looking for. Uh, let's see here. Paul says, I know I put a mark by it, you know, I'm not seeing it on my Bible. Oh yeah, I put a sticky note right over it, the see-through one. Well, if I could see, I could see through the see-through thing. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the beginning of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says, for this pastor to be strengthened in his ministry, he says, and trust to other teachers, other people, who are able to teach also. And trust this word to them. You see the hands of all the teachers, in preschool, elementary. You see the, hand, the hands of the elders. You are partner teachers. Let me see the hands of Sunday school teachers, VBS teachers. Those don't raise your hands very far. That doesn't work very well. <laughs> I guess you did that once, you volunteered and then you got stuck, so you're not ready to so much. <laughs> you are the people that, Tim, that Paul is talking about when he says, and trust to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. They will share in this burden of ministry, teaching the people of God. All that Paul says in First and Second Timothy, is this, preaching and teaching are inseparable. And teaching is not assumed to be achieved by a 20-minute talk once a week on those weeks that you're able to make it. 
You know that teaching doesn't work that way. Any of the things that you value, you know that you must spend more time than that in learning them. And so you devote years of your life to school. And you hours and hours of practice to learn a skill or a sport. But the Word of God requires more of us than just, I'll sit still until Newendorf stops talking once a week. No, Paul says this ministry of the gospel is about engaging with the Word of God together, encouraging and teaching one another, challenging and sharpening each other in the Word, and growing together. Not every congregation has a school, but every faithful congregation is a school. Not every congregation has a school. But every faithful congregation is a school. And really blessed congregations are able to have an actual school so that children also can learn so that there are people who, who help and encourage them, who come alongside the ministers of the word, who, who come alongside parents and helping them to do the one thing they need to do most. Teach. Teach about Jesus. Teach about what God has done for them. Teach about how God loves them. Teach about the, what God is doing in their life and how he's leading them. Teaching families. Because of teaching children, we teach families and we teach parents and we teach grandparents. <laughs> Pastors teach. But what a blessing it is when they have partner teachers with them who take up this load with them. Sunday school teachers teach. But what a blessing it is when they have partner teachers also who are teaching the other days of the week and reinforcing these lessons in those children. Par parents are teachers. Parents teach their children, but what a blessing it is for them when they have partner teachers who help their child to know Jesus Christ, who preserve their child, protect their child from false teaching and false teachers, and who lead them to the feet of Jesus. Pastor Brower knew it well. St. Paul has had a school almost since its very beginning, more than 100 years ago. We had a school in the parsonage when this congregation was first started. The pastor said, I'll live in one half of the parsonage, and the school will be in the other half of the parsonage, where his partner teacher or teachers, I don't know how many teachers they had, taught those children every day until... They had to take the parsonage down to build the church that we have downtown. And then the congregation, as soon as possible, found a way to build a school again. And then as soon as possible, found a way to add on to that school. And then as soon as possible, found ways to bring more people into the school so that they could teach about Jesus. So that today you have a rare treasure. Not just a wonderful facility. You have a faithful faculty. You have partners in the gospel. You have grateful, eager families who are receiving these gifts. You have generations of former students who have been blessed and and are either blessing us here now because of their raising in the faith, or are blessing other congregations as we send them out. Above all, you have preserved here the pure word of God, the good news of eternal life, carefully preserved, faithfully handed down, joyfully shared with you. 
Do you know what you have here? Now listen to the words of Paul in that light. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. St. Paul, continue laboring in harmony. Continue teaching in faithfulness. Continue defending the truth. Continue leading little children and their families to Jesus. Continue lifting up the light of eternal life before all who will look and listen. And raise up a new generation who will teach. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, bless this place. Tomorrow, once again, People will come in through these doors. Parents will bring their children. Kids will come in with all their books and all their things. Lord, as they arrive here, let them come to a place where they are safe. Physically, emotionally, spiritually safe. Oh, Lord, bless each classroom. As the teachers speak to their students there, Lord, let those become spaces that are your sanctuary. Places inhabited by your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless each desk and each student. Lord, as they sit in their seats tomorrow, let them be filled up with your word, built up, trained and led and guided to know you, to love you, to know your love for them. Heavenly Father, bless the, the desk of each of the teachers in this school. Grant that as they arrive to their work, Lord, that they will be encouraged, that they will be strengthened, that they will be joyful to see even perhaps some of the fruit of their labor. Heavenly Father, bless this, this fellowship, this congregation that we may labor together, pastors and teachers and all the other assistants that, that step forward to work with them, that we may use our, our gifts, our resources, all that you have given us to teach, to teach the way of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and sing. Thank you. Take a moment to gather our offerings out of our worship and praise and thanks to God.
that they would be used in the continual teaching of his word here in this place. I also ask that uh, you would take the black folders that are under the uh, chairs on the center aisle here and the chairs on the side aisles there as well. Um, I know we have a number of guests and visitors here today. Also, some of you are returning to, uh, to St. Paul as alumni to celebrate this great weekend. Uh, we'd love to get your contact information. Also, if there's anything new or updated for you, ways that we can be in touch with you, let us know that as well today so that we can continue sharing God's word together. stand. And let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed generations of families through St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. For 60 years, your hand has guided the teaching and instructing, and instructing that has happened here so that children know your word. They've learned of your great love through the death and resurrection of their Savior, Jesus. So we pray that you would continue to work in and through all of us here. We're part of this great church and school today. 
Fill us with that same desire to share your word with families and generations to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We rejoice that you have provided St. Paul with faithful teachers and administrators, staff and volunteers, pastors and church workers for decades. We thank you for the fantastic team that you have assembled that serves this place today. So Holy Spirit, continue to fill them with your strength, your love, and your truth every day so that this continues to be a church and school where generations can come to hear the good news of Jesus again and again. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray that this is a congregation and a, and a ministry where your hands and feet are lived out through the many who gather here. Lord, we pray that you would use us to be a blessing to those who are in need around us in our community, in our neighborhoods, in the places you send us to work and to play. Lord, fill us as your people so that your word would be in our lips and also through our actions that others would see you and your mercy. Lord, we ask that you would work in us to bless those who are in need of your life and healing. We lift up to you those who cry out to you for healing today. We pray for Judy in the hospital. We pray for others who are recovering like Larry, Karen, Bill, and Riza. We ask that you would be with those who are receiving treatment for cancer. Nola, Greg, Leo, and Beth. Bethany and Eric. Virginia, Ken, Shireen, and Stephen, Patty, Deborah, and Tyler. Lord, walk with them daily. Strengthen each of these in body and soul. That they would know your love and your strength. And use us as you give us opportunity to walk alongside them as well. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we're a body that grieves with those who grieve. We grieve the death of our sister Shirley Martin. And so we pray, Lord, that you would continue to show her family your love and strength also. Remind them of the promises that they have in Jesus that you have made to Shirley and make to all of us as well. Because Jesus is risen from the dead, she and we will rise to eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. your great goodness toward us and praise you for the mercy and grace that our eyes have seen and our ears have heard and our hearts have known. Forgive us the sins of this day and those of the past. Pardon our offenses, correct and reform what is lacking in us. Help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have 
called us to be your people, to know your grace and word and sacrament. Make us ready to receive the most holy body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of all of us. Give us grateful hearts as we live under your protective care, trusting in your everlasting goodness and love for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you for all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Please do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Please do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
please stand. The true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. So even to old age and very years, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. So a few announcements this morning. Uh, the first is a uh, joyful announcement. Uh, a uh, call has been extended to a vacancy pastor here at St. Paul to serve in the meantime while we are in the senior pastor call process. And so um, we will... Uh, we have we've, uh, sent that call out, uh, sent out a contract. As soon as that is received back, we expect in the next 24, 48 hours, there will be an email that goes out from St. Paul uh, announcing that information. So um, you can pray about it expectantly, thanking God for, uh, for what he's doing and uh, giving us some uh, support. Actually, it's just me, guys. Uh, but uh, also the rest of the congregation enjoy in this ministry at St. Paul. Um, this is uh, the last weekend where our service at this site starts at 1015. We're shifting to the 1045 uh, time slot for this service on Sunday morning. Uh, but I want to encourage you, as Pastor Newendorf encouraged us in this, uh, in this sermon this morning, to spend time in God's Word together in this ministry at St. Paul, to be in that, uh, that rhythm of learning and teaching that happens here. And so, uh, we, uh, on our weekend services, we'll have a 6.30 service downtown. After our 8.30 service downtown, there will be a Bible study and a Sunday school hour that we call Christ Connections, and so that discipleship hour will happen right after the 8.30 service downtown. And so if you are someone who regularly worships at that earlier service downtown, I encourage you to try starting a new rhythm starting next weekend of going to worship and then gathering with others around God's Word and Bible study. Here at this site, before the 1045 service, we'll gather for some time of fellowship at 930 and then start that Bible study at 945. And I encourage you uh, to start that new rhythm as we go into this next weekend. So think about when does church start? It starts at 9.30 because we're gathered together to spend time in God's word with one another and study. And that'll happen in the gathering place for adults, in the fine arts room for children, in the middle school wing here for middle school students. And we pray that God blesses us as we study his word intentionally together and then gather in this space for worship. So uh, that starts next weekend. We pray that God blesses it. Uh, there are a few things that also start on the 17th. 
Uh, there's a, uh, a workshop for uh, families for the uh, Bible milestone for second and third grade uh, student families. And so check out the information in your worship folder there. Alpha starts on the 17th. Uh, those of you who are um, serving in that way and helping students at Concordia learn more about God's word, um, we look forward to that. We pray that God blesses that next week. And then those of you who are interested in learning more about St. Paul and uh, even becoming new members here, possibly, uh, that pathway class starts next weekend as well. So uh, we look forward to that kickoff of all those great things on the 17th. Uh, inside your worship folder, there's a yellow form, and I uh, encourage you to also uh, check that out before you leave today, if you haven't uh, given it a look already. These are the areas where, uh, as we go into this new uh, rhythm and, uh, and kind of ramp up things for the, the education of this year and some needs of our, uh, of our congregation, uh, these are places where we would love to invite you to consider serving. And so if one of these or more uh, interests you, please, uh, please put a check there, give us your name and information, and then there is a basket in the back uh, where the worship folders are handed out. Uh, you can just drop this right in that basket there and let us know how you uh, can serve. So great ways to get plugged in here at St. Paul through that. Uh, what's the next thing on here? There's a lot. Oh, yes. There's a car wash right after this service. The eighth graders are raising money for their class trip. And so um, I saw a lot of dirty cars. Uh, <laughs> And the construction isn't helping, and they're digging up dirt and stuff. I'm sure your cars got dirtier while they were sitting here. So you get them washed today by our eighth graders, and uh, they'll gladly uh, do that while we're spending time in the picnic together. So uh, so uh, connect with them that are going to be out in the in the drive there, and they'll wash your car for a donation as they head out on their class trip. Uh, before we pray for our meal, I'd like to welcome up Mr. Burgess, and he's going to give a quick announcement about what have also happens right after this service. We're going to do it just like this. All right. Thank you, Pastor Igo. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Excellent. Today we have an opportunity to kick off the 60th anniversary of a school on this campus. 1963, they're laying plans out to... Uh, buy this, not lease some land from Concordia. In 64, in the fall, they open up the first day of school here. Awesome. So as we think about that, we remember what's before, beyond, before us, and we want to be launched for the future. So the school is open up for you to tour, meaning I want you to walk through the building, do three things. Can you remember three things? It's not car wash yet. It's not food yet, it is reflect on the past. Live in the, live in the present. Our teachers do an awesome job now. So reflect on the past. There'll be pictures and do you know who this is, Pastor Rago? Right in the middle. It looks like the main character in Chosen, doesn't it? It does. It could be Jesus, but it's Richard Normeyer, former principal. Who remembers Richard Normeyer? All right, excellent. I'm going to hide this in the building. You have to have a treasure hunt to find this one. And Elaine Bachman's over here, too. Okay? I said, that's got to be Elaine. I walked over there, and she goes, yeah, it's me. All right. Excellent. And uh, Elizabeth Frederick goes, well, that's a schmoody boy right there. So reflect on the past, live in the present, and dream for the future. We have a building project going on, so there will be places. Uh, Mrs. Slack is going to be in the library, which is going to be a new preschool room. And I'll be in the garden area. Tell you about more about our library going on there. So please walk through the building, take a look at every classroom. Our teachers are in there. Say hi to them. Look at the uh, pictures and yearbooks in the classrooms along the way. Take your time. Even though there's food going to be out right now, it's not ready yet, guys. It's, it's not going to be ready for half an hour, right? Maybe a little before that. All right. We don't want people to leave. Um, we want them to stick around. So. Yes, yes. There's overachievers. You have to be in line first for the chicken. But our teachers would like to have some chicken left over when they get done in the classroom. So, so the teachers will be there for a little while. But after you eat, if there's nobody in the building, well, teachers, please visit anyways. The classrooms will still be open until the last person leaves or until the last car is washed. Okay? Right. Who's in line first for the car wash? 
You know, it's probably me, because my card's really dirty right now, too. I hit a lot of bugs I'll recently. Race. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Burgess. We're going to have our final hymn, so I invite you to stand. And after our final hymn, there is also a postlude that our brass will be playing. And there is audience participation in the postlude as well. So I invite you to be a part of that. You'll know it when you hear it. All right, let's sing our final hymn together. The, the last thing that I wrote on my list was that I need to pray for the meal. Thank you, John, for reminding me I said I would do this. So let's join together and pray for God's blessing on our picnic and our meal together. The eyes of all look to you, O Lord. And you give us the food that we need in the proper time. You open your hand to us and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. So we come to you, Lord God, Heavenly Father, asking that you would bless these gifts that we gather to receive today from your bountiful goodness. Bless our picnic and our fellowship and our time during the school today, rejoicing in all that you have done, thanking you for your blessings today and looking forward to the ways that you will continue to work in this place in the future. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we'll see.